Mr. Mark Selby, how are you, sir? Mr. Matthew Gordon, doing very well. Coming been, to the end been, of summer. It's been long. It's been long. I was, I've been on holiday. We ah. didn't get to speak to each other. And you've been busy. But we'll talk there about we that in, in, in a minute. But first, we better get that round up. Nickel market, pricing, what, what's, what's driving all of that? Yeah, since the last two weeks, um, we saw nickel prices basically bouncing around that 16,000, 16,000. 500 ton level where you know things are pretty well supported um and we saw a little pop up um where it's sort of in the 16800 range we actually touched 17000 again i don't expect to see you know still again on track for 20000 by year end but i think it'll be sort of later in september into october uh you know when we see things you know start to move but it's fairly standard um behavior seasonality of this and uh you expect it you're, you're, you're sort of comfortable with this. Maybe the market is less comfortable with it. So can we talk about, you know, some of the kind of market uh, movers and shakers out there, the, the, the holy triumvirate of, of, of Philippines, Indonesia, and, and China? What's happening with them? Yeah, so so that's the something in terms of support, you know, why, um, uh, again, sort of support for multiple thesis that we talked about earlier in the year. So, you know, we've seen ore prices move up by 12.5% um, just in the last two weeks alone, or $6 a ton. And remember, you're looking at about $120, 120 tons of ore to make one ton of nickel at that grade. So $6 has basically just increased the cost for, for all these operations by about $750 a ton. Since the beginning of January, those prices have gone up 50%. And so, you know, the, the, the key piece here is, uh, you know, again, at the beginning of the year, you know, Indonesia is flooding the market. They have like an unlimited amount of ore, you know, it's whatever amount of nickel the market needs, Indonesia is going to produce it. Well, uh, it turns out Indonesia doesn't have quite as much ore, you know, obviously as, as ore prices going up. Um, but up until June, they've now been ramping up imports of ore from the Philippines. Um, Tell and me so, more. What? Most, yeah. So it's an equivalent to 3% of global supply is what they, they, they imported in June. And so there's a couple things going on. You know, one is, you know, Indonesia's, you know, the, the amount of ore that's being produced is being limited. So they're having to fill in the quantity that they need from, from uh, material in the Philippines. Um, but um, there's, there's other stats and we put some of these charts in, in, in the document there is that um, the average NPI grade has dropped from about 13 and something percent down to, well, but 13% down to below 12%. And so, you know, what that group drop in grade means is effectively derating that capacity. I've already talked about the fact that, you know, at 1.8% ore, you're producing 8,000 tons. At 1.5, it's about 6,500 tons. And at the end of the day, if you have to melt more iron to produce uh, produce nickel, you know, you're going to give up nickel, even more nickel production. And so, you know, the, the, in Indonesia has been... Laterite deposits are really easy to high grade. They've been high grading for nickel grade. They've been high grading for uh, nickel to iron ratio to keep that NPI grade in a certain range. And they've been you know high grading for slag chemistry to be able to melt everything and have everything you know separate uh, the way you want. And so the fact that they're importing this much ore from the Philippines is 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 significant in terms of okay they obviously are missing one or more of those things in terms of what they're trying to produce. What that means for the fall right now, it's not so much of an issue because the Philippines overproduces for about eight months of the year. And then they have this rainy season, which we talk about every fall um, as we get into, into uh, you know, the Western winter. And so uh, they have to stockpile ore in China in advance of this Philippine ore coming off. So right now, uh, not not necessarily a big issue in terms of supplying that ore, but it'll be interesting to see, you know, what those ore inventories get to starting in winter time and we could see a real squeeze on Chinese NPI production. I haven't done the math yet to see what that looks like, but that's something that we'll keep an eye on um, as we as we go through the fall. Right. But, but let's bring China into that kind of, in the conversation a bit more, actually, because I think all year um, people have been decrying the kind of slowdown of the Chinese economy. We've talked about it a lot on um, some of some of the shows that we've, we've done. Um, there's a feeling that perhaps the shackles have been um, released and that we will be kind of moving into a, a, a hard demand um, period now for the last second half of this year. I mean, do you agree with that? Uh, again, China's, China's been weaker than expected. Um, you know, we weren't expecting huge amounts of, of growth from China. Um, the key piece here, you know, global stainless and alloy consumption, you know, continues to be robust. We see nickel demand through the first, um, you know, first five or six months of the year at eight uh, percent year over year. 
that's without the EV restocking, significant EV restocking that we're expecting. Uh, I, we, we've seen lithium prices go down a whole other lake, which again is slowing down that EV restocking. And there, there are other economies in the world outside China. And so uh, I think, again, as long as we end up in you know high single digits, maybe we won't get to my double digit forecast that I was expecting earlier in the year. But I expect that we'll stay in the high single digit range, you know, potentially low um, double digit range. And, you know, in general, the nickel market will end up in a great place, um, you know, supply demand wise, again, in a far, far better place than most of the quote experts were, were talking about earlier, earlier in the year. Okay. And to your point, there are other markets other than China. I think, I think first bit of the company news, um, Electra Battery Metals, interesting announcement for that. That's uh, congrats to Trent and team. Um, you know, that is, 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 a, is a great chunk of money. Uh, for the company, um, uh, given you know wh- where they are market cap wise right now, I note that type of stuff takes a huge amount of work to pull off. So great that they were able to do it. The key piece there is you know, the support for the midstream. Uh, you know, this is something that we we announced our net zero metal subsidiary in terms of producing nickel and taking our nickel chrome magnetite product and converting it into material for the stainless steel and alloy market. You know, as much as governments are fussed about having enough mine production that's, quote, safe, doesn't come from China or Indonesia or the Congo, uh, they are equally or even more fussed about having that transformation capacity occur in North America. Because if there is not a path to end users in North America, then they're always, uh, you know, they'll always be held hostage potentially by the Chinese or other countries that aren't as friendly to the United States. And so, you know, the read through for Electra for $20 million US, you know, you should look at any other midstream projects. And there's very few, you know, in terms of that level of government support, you know, we're seeing that kind of same attitude from the Ontario and Canadian government here, um, you know, for our projects. Um, And again, the same level of interest from US governments uh, as well. So, you know, kudos uh, for Electra, you know, to fill a hole in terms of cobalt processing in North America, you know, and we're looking to fill that hole from a nickel perspective. Right. And I, th- I think the interesting thing about Electra um, Bashing Metals um, for us from the early days with them was people concerned about the DRC factor. Uh, yeah. It's kind of clear either that's been resolved or we're at the point with critical minerals that perhaps no one cares uh, as much as they used to uh, claim to care. Um the DOD getting involved, I think, one from a critical minerals perspective, is is very 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 positive. Um, it's it's not a it's not a, a bottomless pit of money, but it's interesting that the Canadian company has been selected there. Um, first of all, so can you t- kind of talk to those those two things, um, the DRC uh, factor and getting your feet from there, and and to um, you know the, the involvement here of of the DOD into friendly folk light Canada. Yeah, no, so that that Congo thing is is an excellent point. The news release, you know, explicitly says that feed material for that refinery is going to come from the Congo, but sort of you know, um sustainably mined material from Glencore and from an you know, one other uh one other producer there. And so it again underscores they want that transformation capacity to be able to, you know, that transformation capacity in North America and so Yes, you know, we will take material from places that we maybe sort of slap things with a very, very broad brush in terms of impact. But uh, again, if if the mines are operated sustainably, safely, um, and not corruptly, um, you know, then then they're interested in, in, in that kind of supply and again, not Chinese controlled. So, uh, you know, I think the read through in terms of where that material through is, is equally insightful to as to the funding funding itself which is which is a great point so okay um and obviously it, it kind of feels like you know critical minerals to me certainly my, my bank, banking days were yeah. a, a a a nice topic but no one really kind of cared there was always a market um to access metals um it seems to be taking a little bit more um prevalence uh and a little getting a little bit more ear time as far as governments are concerned actually rather than the box they just have to take so in, in interesting times for, for metals more broadly and battery metals uh specifically now you mentioned um this is perhaps why a kind of nickel might be selling a downstream business of your own um you you've also got a little bit of news been drilling as well not standing still yeah so read so uh uh, again, Crawford, you know, our team, everyone on our team believes Crawford will be our first project, but not our best project. Uh, read uh, some tremendous intervals, uh, eight holes, all mineralized more than 600 meters uh, long. Um, the best hole 
uh, uh, again, mineralized, well mineralized from top to bottom, 100 meters of over 0.4% and even 40 meters at 0.54. Again, our big bulk tonnage deposits, those 0.4, 0.5 grades, you know, are, are excellent to see. And 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 again, the scale of, of what we're unlocking at Reed is great. We've got seven drill rigs turning uh, on five other targets, uh, neither of which are, uh, are have a resource on it yet. Uh, and all that drilling is going very well. So we'll you know, be providing an update uh, when everybody gets back to work uh, in early September on that front. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Okay, well, like I say, um, you, you're chugging out, chugging out the results um, at the moment. Um, there's a few other companies we kind of we kind of got to blast through um, who we haven't spoken about in a while. So we'll, let's start with Power Nickel. Always a good conversation. Yeah, a few, the last few holes from the winter program, and they're now gearing up for their next program. Uh, again, beautiful, you know, higher grade copper PGM uh, deposit. You know, these lands, you know, there's there's a massive core, and then they sort of, you know, uh, come off a little thinner, a little lower grade to the edges. And, and these were some of the holes on on some of those lower grade edges, but still, still very good results. So, you know, really happy for Terry Lynch and team uh, over there. Uh, SBC Nickel is another one we've been following. Uh, you know, this is an open pitable. Uh, deposit not a lot of those out there but you know the infill program is continuing to, to deliver intervals and widths that you know look a little better um, than that might than what is in their existing resource so really good to see and then you know premium nickel um, who's been drilling extensively uh, down in Botswana published uh, their initial resource there a few weeks ago uh, so a substantial increase um, in those two deposits uh, the main and north uh, in terms of the you know, overall, you know, contain nickel. So, you know, good to see, you know, people making progress and getting decent drill results across that set of projects. Right. So there's a bit of company news. Um, so broadly, I think people trying to work out how, how the nickel market is is going to kind of play out. You're you're sticking to your $20,000 number by end, year end. Um, it's, it's been a quite a summer, I think, for everyone across all, all, all juniors, all commodities. Lots of M&A happening, though. In terms of this sector, nickel, M&A, is there going to be any? Can you see any? Because there's, there's some small companies struggling with cash constraint. Um, there's some projects which are, you know, and developers which are advancing like, like, like yourselves. Are the big boys leaning in at the moment, or is it still kind of like BHP style? We're a little bit nervous about what what market conditions into the future. Yeah, BHP. You know, again, the big mining companies. Uh, again, given how publicly BHP sort of said, "Oh, nickel's going to be bad for a few years," they <laughs> they won't do a three hundred and sixty degree turn uh, for a little bit here. But I can tell you firsthand that you know you are seeing significant value investors, you know, significant private investors, you know, you know who believe in the you know ener- you know the energy transition. You know, these investors who believe that governments are serious about, you know, these these kinds of, of metals as national security issues, that governments are going to continue to provide incentives to see those supply chains get built um, in North America, Europe, friendly countries, you know, to be able to minimize the impact China may, you know, potentially have or in Russia on, on issues uh, in the future. So, um, you know, I would say, it, you know, the, the smart money has popped up in the last three or four months. So, uh, stay tuned on the front, and uh, you know we'll see what happens as the rest of the year goes on. Okay, and does that does that suggest to you or, or inform your thinking with regards to the money available for that infrastructure requirements going forward? And does that still mean that it's going to be a while before the kind of equities are the beneficiaries of some of some of this interest? Uh, I think you'll see you'll see some again the smart money's position because. You know they'll ultimately you know want to get taken out at some point, but I think the you know the 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 value equation right now is 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 at a point where uh, you know it's it's almost stupid for them not to get involved. Give you know given given the valuations of some of these entities. So so again, when these guys start picking away at things, you know that this I, I think you know, should hopefully be the first leg. You know we'll start to see through October November the first leg. You know for again critical minerals, national security minerals. Uh, uh, you know through 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 the end of the year. So, Mark, uh, thanks for the update. Uh, great to see you. We'll see you next week. Sounds great.